For 17 years, the Humber Bridge was the longest single-span suspension bridge in the world. With a main span of 1,410 meters, it remains one of the most impressive bridges ever built. The huge anchorages weigh nearly half a million tons, and the two massive suspension cables are made up of nearly 30,000 individual wires. There's enough wire here to stretch nearly twice round the world. The two towers are so far apart, they were built leaning away from each other to take account of the curvature of the earth. Every week, more than 100,000 vehicles travel across the bridge. Since its opening in 1981, 71 million vehicles have crossed the Humber, each taking less than three minutes. But it took the people of Yorkshire and Lincolnshire over a century of campaigning and nine years of intensive construction work before the dream of a crossing was realized. This is the story of a masterpiece of British engineering. From Roman times, crossing the Humber estuary had always been difficult, if not impossible. The most efficient way of transporting heavy goods was by water. With the Humber situated at the heart of the waterway system, associated with the Trent and the Ouse, it was one of the chief highways of England, draining one-fifth of the country. River traffic brought prosperity to the settlements on its banks, including Hull, Beverley and York on the North Bank, and Barton-upon-Humber, Grimsby, Cleethorpes, Scunthorpe and Lincoln on the South Bank. People wishing to travel between Hull and Lincolnshire were able to use a ferry first established in 1315. Behind me is the um, ticket office of the Manchester, Sheffield and Lincolnshire Railway, which served the ferry from 1880 until its demise in 1981. Now, across the Humber, there'd been various ferries um, from the medieval period, uh, crossing from various points. But um, the ferry, as many people remember it, uh, originated with the Manchester, Sheffield and Lincolnshire Railway, or one of its successors, um, acquiring a pre-existing ferry between um, uh, New Holland and Hull. But the ferry was still painfully slow, and before long, those interested in railway development wanted an alternative link. In 1866, there was um, an alternative scheme to build a, a railway bridge across the Humber, um, which um, was unsuccessful, and um, it foundered quickly. But interest in endeavouring to break the um, monopoly power of the North Eastern Railway on the north bank um, of the Humber and the considerable uh, influence of the Manchester, Sheffield and Lincolnshire Railway on the south bank of the Humber was renewed um, with a Humber tunnel proposal, a railway tunnel, in 1873. But this was also unsuccessful and over the next 100 years several proposals were put forward in an effort to bridge the Humber but none of these ever came to fruition. In 1928, a proposal was put forward to build a multi-span truss bridge, four miles west of Kingston-upon-Hull, between Hessel on the north side and Barton-on-Humber on the south. But the scheme sank without trace in the Great Depression of the late 20s and early 30s. Seven years later, in 1935, the engineer in charge of the aborted scheme, Sir Ralph Freeman, put a new proposal forward to build a suspension bridge with a main span of 1,372 metres. This type of bridge was chosen so that there would be no support piers obstructing the estuary. This second plan, however, was put on ice by the outbreak of World War II. 
1955, Freeman, Fox and partners presented a new report on the crossing, again for a suspension bridge. This led to the creation of the Humber Bridge Board, with powers to construct, operate and maintain the bridge and its approach roads. But before work could begin, the board would need to raise £28 million to construct the bridge, which would be repaid in part by tolls on vehicle users. Meanwhile, the only way to cross the Humber was to use the sometimes delayed and unpredictable ferry service. The waiting went on, and still no sign of a bridge. For those not wanting to queue for the ferry, it was possible to take a 50-mile detour around the river, but this was not ideal. It was a fairly tortuous trip. Um, the A18 was notorious for its um, traffic levels, particularly heavy goods vehicles, and you only need an accident on a road like that, and your two-hour journey could be extended by at least an hour, if not more. In 1966, the Minister of Transport, Barbara Castle, pledged at a Labour by-election meeting that the bridge would be built. Talks continued for several years, and there were at last signs that a bridge would become reality. Finally, in 1971, the government decided to provide 75% of the funds required to build the new bridge. At long last, the detailed design work could be started. For the engineers, the project presented a huge challenge. And for the people separated by the river, it meant a new direct link, allowing faster journey times and a chance for further development of trade and industry on both sides of the river. Most of us will know and admire Tower Bridge in London, but it's small compared with the Severn Bridge in southwest England, the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, the Verrazzano Bridge in New York. All are dwarfed by the 1,410 metre span of the new Humber Bridge. For the first part of the construction, two huge concrete blocks would need to be cast into the ground one on the north bank at Hessel and the other on the south bank at Barton. These would eventually provide the firm anchorages needed for the suspension cables. Two 155 and a half meter high towers will support the cables and deck structure with the Barton Tower founded deep into the riverbed. Mr. Minister, my lord, ladies and gentlemen, today I welcome you all to the first little function to be held on this site uh, of this very great bridge which is about to be erected. This is to be, I hope, the first occasion, the public occasion, connected with the actual construction. Ladies and gentlemen, I have great pleasure in unveiling this plan. <laughs> Paint marks on a block of concrete were the first signs that the Humber was finally to be bridged. Well, I answered uh, an advert uh, for uh, an excavator driver wanted, and uh, when I came for the interview, it was down on the foreshore in uh, some offices beside the mill. And this guy had a, a second hand digger and he wanted a driver for it because he knew we'd get the contract for working uh, to John Howard on the Humber Bridge. So I came down and I got the job and uh, we started and the first job with the bridge was really uh, down on the beach on the, the foreshore we had to clear uh, you know woods and trees and fencing and clearing all sorts of uh, different things out of the way for the main construction the geology of the area dictated the design of the foundations with any sort of engineering construction the unknown area is what you find when you get down into the ground um, it's the area that's unpredictable and in fact at the Humber Bridge on, on the northern side of the Humber the ground conditions were quite simple because you're onto nice easy chalk solid rock whereas on the southern end of the bridge you've got a boulder clay 
um, layer, which is much more difficult to work in. And to compound the problem, one of the foundations there, the Southern Tower, is actually in the river. A suspension bridge is only as strong as its anchor points. At Hessel, on the north bank of the river, work began by digging a 21 metre deep hole through the solid chalk. Inside it, the walls were strengthened and engineers began building a wire framework. The anchorage on the south bank at Barton required a slightly different design. Because of the poor ground conditions there, the engineers began building a huge cellular structure, 35 meters in the ground, to support the main anchorage block. Meanwhile, at Hessel, the wire frame was in place and the anchorage could be filled with concrete. Tons of it. The work at both sides of the river never stopped. The cellular structure below ground at Barton was now complete and filled in with sand and water to restore the ground loading. At Hessel, concrete sections were built up until they reached a height of 40 meters above the founding level. Inside are the final anchor points and massive steel supports for the cables. Each anchorage will carry the approach road and withstand a pulling strain of almost 40,000 tons. Barton Tower would be located 500 meters from the shoreline. A temporary jetty was built so that work could start on the tower foundations which consist of two 24-metre diameter concrete structures called caissons. These hollow tubes would be built in three-metre sections, whilst simultaneously sunk deep into the riverbed to form a pier on which the tower would stand. Sheet steel piles were driven into the riverbed to form a figure of eight shape. Sand was then tipped in, creating an artificial island. Steel moulds were laid out and concrete was poured in, gradually forming the sections of the caissons. After the concrete had set, sand was excavated to allow the caissons to sink. Then the next three metre section was added on top of the first. Meanwhile, at Hessel, the next stage of construction could begin. From the groundwork, um, after several months and getting all the cages ready, we went on to the, uh, the process of the tower leg, which was uh, slip form. Uh, in other words, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. An operating platform was devised so that the two legs of each tower could be constructed simultaneously. It was supported on 48 hydraulic jacks designed to claw their way up tubes cast in the concrete as it was raised. The towers proceeded at an astonishing rate. As bucket after bucket of concrete was poured around the steel mesh, the towers grew at 77 millimetres per hour. 
you worked in all the weathers, hill, rain, snow, blow. Um, your brakes, you had your tea brakes, whatever height the platform was on, you had your tea brakes up there. If you did get any spare time, you could look over the side and see people gazing up at you, you know, because it was a marvellous thing. Sand excavation at the Barton Pier progressed. As each section was built up, the caissons sank under their own weight, helped by steel cutting edges at their base and a bentonite lubricating layer injected into the ground around the caisson walls. Everything was going to plan until the first of two major problems occurred during the sinking of the west caisson. Clay was encountered sooner than expected. The whole caisson structure then tended to tilt. The solution was to cut away the clay with a high-pressure water jet. Excavation resumed and the caissons continued to sink evenly. About 30 metres from the bottom, the engineers hit another problem. The caisson broke through a clay layer containing water under pressure. The lubricant that was supposed to make the job easy all got washed away by this pressurised water and the, um, the caissons got stuck much too high up to have, to have reached the uh, founding layer that they had to get down to. There was actually one point there where the caissons, these hollow tubes, filled up with water so fast from this artesian uh, well uh, that the water was several metres higher than the river level outside the caisson, so it was, it was like a, uh, a swimming pool established um, several metres above where you would have normally expected and which caused people to leave the caissons quite quickly as you can imagine. They ended up actually shipping in steel ingots from Scunthorpe from the steel mills and piling them on top until with a very big crack the, uh, the caissons set up motoring downwards. Now founded firmly below the riverbed the steel piles were removed and the caissons could be linked and capped, ready to take the tower legs. Because of the problems with the caissons, the tower could not be started until well after the Hessel Tower was finished. However, it reached full height in just 10 weeks, with an average rate of climb of 100 millimetres per hour. It was a proud day for the men who had finally reached the tops of the towers. Yep, I was there when we topped out. I was there in all the photographs, topping out with me, polythene breaker in me and with the trick inside, yeah. That's right, yeah, with the flag. Brilliant day, lovely day. After 42 months of intensive civil engineering work, the substructure was completed and handed over to British Bridge Builders Limited, the firm responsible for the construction of the cables and deck structure. With two temporary cranes assembled at the top of each tower, the massive 45-ton cable saddles were lifted in place. The whole future design geometry of the bridge depended on the intricate placing of these saddles. The very first link across the Humber began simply, with three men in the water and three men in a boat. With them was the rope that would draw the very first cable across the whole width of the estuary. Two steel mesh walkways were slung parallel to where the finished cables would be. This gave safe access for construction workers as they began the cable spinning operation. Each of the two main cables was made up of nearly 15,000 separate wires. For this, 44,000 miles of wire was needed. The coils were joined by specially designed linkages clamped on by a hydraulic press, making one continuous wire. This was wound onto large drums, then fed up to the tensioning towers 
into one of the two anchorage chambers and then passed around a shoe. Two wires were looped around a spinning wheel which was ready to start its journey across to the south anchorage. At the same time, another wheel would be leaving the south anchorage on its way north for reloading. This operation was repeated day and night and the engineers working on the footbridges and here at the top of the tower had to face varying weather conditions. To complete the spinning operation, the two wheels would have to make about 7,500 crossings in all. Finally, the wheel reaches the south anchorage. The wires could be removed and the empty wheel was ready to return to the north side for reloading. The wires were looped around a strand shoe and tied off. Seven thousand five hundred crossings later, the wires are now laid. To achieve the familiar solid circular shape, compacting machines squeeze the assembly. Cable bands then fix the newly shaped strands in place. A final check was made to ensure the diameter was within tolerance. The cables were coated with red lead paste, then wrapped in steel wire. The two cables were now in place and ready to take the weight of the deck structure. The deck was constructed at Priory Yard, downriver from the bridge. The task was to coordinate deliveries of more than 3,000 components needed to make up 124 hollow box sections of the bridge deck. Each of these, complete with handrails, cable trays and drainage pipes, was transported to the Humber on a double-track rail line to a specially assembled twin gantry, which picked up the deck from the railway and carried it beyond the water's edge, where it was lowered onto the pontoon at the riverside. We came along quite regularly. I think the most impressive thing I thought of at the time was um, the sections coming from the construction yard further downstream. And they'd come up to just below the bridge and of course they'd be hauled up into place. But I, I was amazed at the speed which they seemed to be slotted into place. I thought while well, watching one of these it take up all the afternoon but uh, one was done and another one was coming up behind. It was quite amazing. Weather permitting, two boxes a day were lifted into place. As the sections were lifted in, the bridge was now really taking shape. It was just great watching the road gradually get in place. You know, how long is it going to be? <laughs> um, and then I had the chance to go out and see the last section to be lifted. I can't exactly remember how long it took to hoist it up. Probably about 20 minutes. Um, I'm not sure, but it didn't seem long. It was very high to go up, but it didn't seem long at all. And to actually see the final section go into place and just look along and see a complete road was, it was great. And it, oh, it's finally done. Yeah. With the arrival of the asphalt machines, the final road surface could be laid. Finally, the crash barriers and other street furniture were added. 
toll booths and a control room were built on the Hessel side of the Humber, and approach roads were completed and linked into the main road network. Up to 900 men at a time worked on the bridge in all weathers, day and night. After a total of nine years, the bridge was finally completed. But this new modern crossing inevitably brought about the end of a traditional one. Well, there was a, there was a very long and noble tradition of ferries across the Humber and I think when the ferry disappeared it had a very big effect on the psyche of the people who lived in the area because it was part and parcel of the area. Passengers and crew gathered to celebrate the life and times of the Humber ferry as it set sail on its very last trip. From the end of one era to celebrations of the beginning of a new one. Her Majesty the Queen was invited to officially open the new Humber Bridge. I am very pleased to have been invited to open the Humber Bridge today. It is quite clear from the very first sight of this bridge that it is not only its size, but also its beauty that makes it such a splendid advertisement for British engineering. I congratulate everyone who has been involved in any way with the project from start to finish. By their boldness, resolution, ingenuity and imagination, they have created a material expression of confidence in the future and, I hope, have ensured the economic health of Humberside. And the benefits of their achievement will be spread far wider than that. The faith shown in the bridge has been sustained over a long period in spite of setbacks. You now have no less than three motorways and your own airport. If the removal of frustration in travel is as vital as I believe, this area must be a land of opportunity. I have every confidence that there are many waiting to grasp it. It gives me great pleasure to unveil this plaque and declare the Humber Bridge open. There's a picture on the walls of this office across the way there, which, is, which shows England as it was about a thousand years ago in the times of the uh, Saxon kings. And the two sides of the river were separate countries at that time. When I first came in um, 1980, I got the impression that not much had changed in the previous uh, thousand years. Well, well now, um, there are six million vehicles crossing the river every year compared with 90,000 a year, which used to travel on the ferry. 90,000 vehicles we're carrying in five days. And that gives you a measure of the extra connections that there are between the two sides of the river. But this extra connection came with a price. The estimated cost to build a bridge was 28 million pounds, which was partly borrowed by the Humber Bridge Board from the government. The final cost came to 98 million pounds as a result of the technical problems and high interest rates at the time of construction. When the bridge opened, the interest on the loan had already increased the debt to 151 million pounds. The income received from toll collections has never been sufficient to pay this debt, which has grown year after year until, in 1993, it reached 435 million pounds. 
about 40% uh, of our budgets every year go on the maintenance of the bridge. And there, there are certain large-scale tasks, like keeping the bridge painted. Uh, and we've actually got 20 acres of painted steel that we work on out there. So that's, that's quite a big task. It maybe costs us half a million pounds to paint that. Um, and then running in parallel with that, there's a different number of jobs every year, such as this year we're replacing uh, bolts in the cable clamps right high on the cables. And then superimposed even above that, we've got all of the routine maintenance, checking that fans are working, that lights are kept in good condition, that sort of thing. So it's, a, it's quite a mixture of um, different pieces. Cameras mounted at various positions on and around the bridge feed live pictures to the control room next to the toll booths, where staff can monitor traffic movement 24 hours a day. The bridge crossing offers massive savings on journey times and can save up to 50 miles in travelling distance. But the old way of crossing the Humber has never been forgotten. Many people have fond memories of the ferry because quite often you spent a lot of time on it. It spent half of its time on sandbanks. Um, it offered a service which we can't offer at the bridge to the extent there was a very fine bar which was open as soon as the ferry set sail. So it was a social event as much as, uh, as a means of travel to get across the river. Uh, and generations of people had actually worked on it, employed by the railway company working on the ferry and many of those, several of those, came to work for us actually in the early days. Well, I would, I would remember the ferries with a bit of uh, nostalgia because they were uh, very old, even in the last days. I mean, they were ancient and all the brass engines and I remember things like that and in later years having a drink in the bar when I got, <laughs> when I got older. But... Three of the ferries are still in existence today, although not in use. The Lincoln Castle is at Grimsby Marina, the Wingfield Castle at Hartlepool, and the Tattershall Castle is moored on the River Thames. The Farringford, which was brought in from the Isle of Wight to cover the last days of the ferry service, was later broken up on the banks of the Humber. The Humber Bridge held the record for 17 years for being the longest single-span suspension bridge in the world. But this title was lost to new, even longer suspension bridges under construction. A lot of us thought, oh, it'll be a white elephant, it'll never happen, we get too many high winds. But it did happen, we've got it, and I'm glad we've got it. The Humber Bridge is much more than just a road link. It's a symbol of the local area, which is recognised everywhere. An engineering masterpiece that has already become a major tourist feature. But essentially, the Humber Bridge is a key element in the whole prosperity of the region, on both the north and south banks of the estuary.